Hello, Mike. Thank you. And hello to everyone else, and thank you too for joining us on another edition of Broken Bread. This is brought to you through Mike Coles from newliferadio.co.uk and from me, Ron Bailey, from biblebase.com. And we're working our way through a study guide to a book that I wrote some years ago called The Better Covenant. And we've arrived at study 10. And the title for this evening's study is Conditional Covenants. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. So let's make a start, shall we? Here we are. First, let's set the scene for the Sinai Covenant. We'll omit the first three months of their journey from Ramesses to the wilderness of Sin, just so that we can focus on our main topic at this point, which is the Sinai Covenant. This covenant, the Sinai Covenant, the Moses Covenant that it's sometimes referred to, is the perpetual backdrop to the whole of the Old Testament period and the Scriptures, stretching from Sinai right through to Calvary. When the Old Covenant came to an end, and the New Covenant was initiated. That means that it encompasses the whole history of the nation of Israel throughout the events of the rest of the wilderness wanderings, the conquest of the land of Canaan, the period of the judges, the establishment of the monarchy, the division of the nation into the two nations of the house of Israel and the house of Judah, the banishment of the house of Israel, the captivity of the house of Judah, the return of a tiny faithful remnant of the house of Judah. And meanwhile, on the international stage, the Empire of Babylon, often called Neo-Babylonian, and then the Empire of Medo-Persia, the Greek Empire of Alexander, that division of that empire on his death into four empires and the times of the kings of the north and the kings of the south, the insane rule of Antiochus Epiphanes, who was one of the kings of the north, and the stubborn courage of the Maccabees, the rise of the Roman Empire and its rule of the land of Israel, the emergence of the Sadducees and Pharisees, the spread of the Greek language through the lands of Alexander's old empires, the incarnation and the earthly ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. Israel's whole history is the fulfillment of the promised blessings and curses of the book of Deuteronomy. All that God prophesied by Moses on Mount Nebo was fulfilled in the storyline of the Old Testament. So, how did all this begin? Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. I preached on this recently, so if you prefer a... Uh, preaching to teaching, uh, if you search biblebase.co.com and look for, what do we call it? Oh, the Gospel according to Moses. Um, you'll find a preached version of this. It won't be the same. It never is the same. Let me just go through this. These three verses in Exodus chapter 6 are key verses. They set the scene really for the next five books of the Bible. God is speaking to Moses, and he says, it, it's, um, it's at three different locations. If the first verse is Egypt, the second verse is Sinai, and the third verse is Canaan. So we start off with Egypt. Wherefore, say to the children of Israel, I am Jehovah. And we've just had five chapters introducing Jehovah and seeing something of who he is, and then we shall see more in his power. Wherefore, say to the children of Israel, I am Jehovah, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And then change the scene changes to Sinai. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am Jehovah, your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And then lastly, the scene changes again to Canaan. And I will bring you in 
unto the land which I swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it you for a heritage. I am Jehovah. God sealing that prophetic promise at the beginning and at the end with the statement, I am Jehovah. He's put his name to this. He's signed up for this. We're going to concentrate on the second location, that's to say Sinai, because this is where the people now, having left Egypt and having witnessed all that God promised in the first verse, Exodus 6 and verse 6, we now move to Exodus 6 and verse 7. I'll take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am Jehovah your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. It's very easy, you know, for people uh, to be conscious of what's in the past and what's in the future. Oh, happy day that fixed my choice, and won't it be wonderful there? But there's this other verse in the middle. God brings them to Sinai specifically to enter into a relationship with each other where he would become theirs and they would become his. Where both parties to this covenant would be able to say, from this day on, you are mine, very much like a wedding covenant. So let's look at the arrival at Sinai. They gather here, just imagine, 600,000 foot soldiers plus their wives and children and some older folks too, no doubt, um, gathered in the plains in front of Mount Sinai. The Bible, on a couple of occasions, calls this the day of the assembly. This is the great gathering. And here's an interesting thing, which maybe we'll develop a little bit later. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10, and Deuteronomy 18 and verse 16, in two occasions, this event, this whole period of time at Mount Sinai, is referred to as the day of the assembly. Deuteronomy 9 and verse 10, Then the Lord delivered to me, says Moses, two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on mount, the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And then in chapter 18 and verse 16, according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb, that's the other name for Sinai, in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die in the day of the assembly. We've mentioned this before, but at a certain period, about 200 years before Christ, many of the Hebrew, the Jewish people, had dispersed throughout the Mediterranean, and many had almost forgotten their Hebrew language. So they translated the Hebrew Bible into a Greek version known as the Septuagint, often just the letters LXX. It was a Greek version of the Bible, made for people who spoke a form of Greek called Koine Greek, which came into being really as a result of Alexander's conquest. And it, its heyday was from about 200 BC to about 200 AD. And where here we have the word assembly, the Hebrew has the word kahal. And when, most often, when the Septuagint comes across the word kahal, it translates it with a Greek word, ecclesia, which you may know. That's the word for the church. The events that took place at the foot of Mount Sinai were the day of the church. This is where the church of Jehovah, the church in the wilderness, came into existence. This unique relationship between God and the people. The people of Israel, of course, their commission was, well, God said to them, I am Jehovah. You are my witnesses, says Jehovah. They were to be his witnesses. There's another church, of course. Jesus said, I will build my church. And he also said that when the Holy Spirit came, those who were his would become his witnesses. 
the people of Israel had no evangelistic commission. They were to be witnesses. Their lives were to reveal the character of the God that they served. And that's true too for New Covenant people. But there's another dimension for the New Covenant because not only have we the statement that when the Spirit comes we shall be witnesses, we also have a commission which says go into all the world and preach the gospel. Israel had no evangelistic commission but was required to be the witnesses of Jehovah. Moses is about to make his first ascent to Sinai. This is Exodus 19 and verse 3. And Moses went up unto God. And Jehovah called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, and you can see it's going to go on, but you can see it's setting the scene here. Moses is about to become the mediator, the middleman. He is be about to become the messenger going to and fro between God and the people. To use kind of legal language, the party, what do they call it, the party of the first part, that would be Jehovah, and the party of the second part, that would be the people of Israel. And Moses is the go-between. He is the mediator. So this is how Moses makes his first journey. Everybody else is forbidden to touch this mountain, let alone ascend it. But Moses is required to go up and to be in the presence of God. So, having mentioned this legal jargon, <laughs> not that I know that I'm really using it accurately, the two the parties, let's have a look at the two parties to the covenant, because this will be key in our understanding. The first is obviously Jehovah. He is the one who initiates he, the covenant. He is the one who, as a result of this covenant, will bring into being a new legal entity called the nation of Israel. Up until this point, they're just a family. This promise is to the house of Jacob, you see there in 19 and verse 3, and tell the children of Israel. That's a Hebrew parallelism. That's the same group of people under two different headings. They are the descendants of Jacob, or Israel, as he became. And Jehovah is going to enter into a covenant with them. <clears throat> so the whole of Genesis and these earlier chapters of Exodus have introduced who the party of the first part, Jehovah, is. And now it's addressed to the house of Jacob, which is the party of the second part. At this point, they were not a nation, they were a family. They were an enormous extended family. They had become a people group, but they had not been constituted as a nation. They were a family. And God says to this people who is a family, and this is verse 19 and verse 6, chapter 19 verse 6, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. That's actually the first reference to Israel as a nation in that sense. God had made promises that he would give uh, the descendants of Abraham would become a nation. But this really is the first time that God addresses them as with the possibility of them being a nation. The covenant would constitute a family into a nation. And he is the mediator, Exodus. And he says this, and you shall be unto me, that's the third person in this grouping of the two covenant parties and the mediator. And he says, we've referred to this verse several times, but it is key. You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Moses' role is established now. He is to be the mediator between God and the children of Israel. And in the next chapters, we'll see him ascending and descending Sinai. It's an amazing thing that in the midst of this covenant making, Israel sinned grievously against God, betrayed him, was unfaithful. And God said to Moses that he was ready to start again, to draw a line under the failure of Israel and to start again with one man. 
Now therefore let me alone. This is Exodus 32 verse 10. Now therefore let me alone. That my wrath may wax hot against them. And that I may consume them. And I will make of thee a great nation. God was beginning ready to begin all again. All over again with Moses. And Moses of course pleaded with God. Put his own life on um, on the table. This covenant then is going to be vital, and there are preconditions to it. This covenant isn't a kind of a Bible promise that you can take out of a hat or from a, a Bible promise box. It's actually addressed to people who are unique people, are people who have had other events in their lives which have been significant and crucial. And in Exodus 19 and verse 4 to 6, we have this. God says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. So this, this isn't addressed to spectators. This is addressed to people who have been in the thick of it. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians. These are people with a history. And how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. God says, okay, this is the people I'm speaking to. This is who these words are addressed to. You who have seen what I did to the Egyptians, you who have experienced how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself, now therefore. So these are the preconditions. And then it comes on to other conditions. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be mine own possession from among all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall become unto me a kingdom of priests and, here it is, a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak to the children of Israel. This is some further study for you. In the first letter of Peter, Peter uses the events of the Exodus as a, a, kind, a kind of a pattern in which to express the glory, the revelation of the New Testament. Um, the gospel. And um, you'll see he constantly refers to and uses terms which really were first applied to the first people of God. And here's a key one. This is 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. For, Peter, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Now, does that little phrase remind you of anything, that he might bring us to God? Well, we've just seen it. In Exodus chapter 19, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. There are some people who believe, and I think there's a lot of weight for this view, that there's a reference here to the way in which a bride would be brought to her husband at the day of the, the wedding, when the wedding was constituted and they became one. And the wife could say, you are mine. And the husband can say, you are mine. Certainly God uses the picture of a wedding. And Israel becomes the bride of Jehovah. As a result of this covenant. And in fact, this is the first time that God has really mentioned this covenant to the people of Israel. Oh, he said to Moses, referred to other covenants. But now he isn't just going to deliver them. He isn't just going to take them into the promised land. He's going to do something which in many ways is at the heart of this whole event. I'm going to make you my own people. And you're going to come into a covenant with me. So there's no reference to the covenant until the people are have been brought to God. And now they're in the place where they must make their choice. Now, this covenant must have two willing members. Wilt thou take this man to be thy lawful wedded husband? Wilt thou take this woman to be thy lawful wedded wife? And the answer is not, I do. The answer is, I will. And here, God is putting before them the prospect of him saying, I will, and them saying, I will. Similarly, I find this intriguing in the Gospel accounts. There's no reference to a new covenant until Calvary is in sight. There's no mention 
in the Acts to a covenant at all. It's only when people are brought to God through Christ that the truth of the new covenant begins to open out. This is Luke chapter 22. This is the only time Jesus referred to this covenant. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood or by my blood, which is shed for you. So he, Moses brings the words of God to the people and he takes the words of the people to God. And to begin with, this is in broad terms of the covenant. It's a very basic thing. If you do this, then I will do this. And it, 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 this is how the covenant begins in broad terms. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you unto myself. Now, therefore, because the ancient power is broken, and the children of Israel are free, as free as birds, on eagles' wings, they've come to the point of decision, and so must we all. And then God says, Now, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall become mine own possession from among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall become unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. These are, this is a vital statement here as God presents these things. This is a conditional covenant. These are God's conditions to this covenant. And they have to go in a critical path. That's to say that our dependence is one thing can't happen until another thing has happened before it. So you have to go from one to two to three to four to five. You, you can't go from one to five or do start off with five. It has to be in this order. You're brought face to face, if you like, with God, with the reality of who God is and what he's done in Christ. And then you come to this place, the place of the choice. Because the ancient power is broken, and you're as free as a bird to make your own choice, you come to the point of decision. If you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall become mine own possession. From among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. And the holy nation, these are the words which thou shalt speak to the children of Israel. So we're following critical path. They experienced a clear event of redemption and deliverance in which God had made a clear distinction between the children of Israel and the Egyptians. He had brought them to this place in their story. He had borne them unto eagles' wings and brought them to myself. This has all been preparatory up until this point. But now, therefore, because you come to this point, you can now respond to this. If you obey my voice and you will keep my covenant, then blessing will ensue. That is, a, you'll become a special treasure, you'll become his people, you'll become a holy nation. Let me put some personal pronouns. My special people. My people. My holy nation. That's um, that's a bit of basic code. I did have a, uh, an attempt at it, but it was pathetic. Uh, <laughs> I learned basic code on my spectrum in 1982, and I don't remember any of it. This is this is broad, ba basic anyway. Uh, please. This isn't the level that Matthew works at normally. Uh, this is just to, um, just for my benefit. If you will obey my voice and you will keep my covenant, then blessing will ensue. And the blessing is you'll become my special treasure. My people, my holy nation. That's utterly logical following a critical path. This is an amazing place that God brings them to, and the details of this covenant making 
are so meticulously recorded, it's clearly of central value to the rest of the history of the people of Israel. So, their response. I sometimes jokingly say that there are some decisions that are far too important to be left to the elders. And it's one, this is one of the verses that makes me say it. And I know this is my peculiar sense. This is Exodus chapter 19, verse 7 to 8. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and set before them all these words which Jehovah commanded him. <laughs> but it isn't the elders who respond, it's all the people. And all the people answered together, well, might be, and said, all that Jehovah has spoken we will do. And Moses, back up the mountain he goes, reports the words of the people unto Jehovah. So this is the broad brush declaration of the covenant. If you keep, keep these two conditions, having come to this place in your experience, if you, if you make a choice to, to say, I will, to these two conditions, he doesn't ask you if you do, he asks you if you are willing. If you are willing to obey my voice, and if you are willing to keep my covenant, that's your part of this obligation fulfilled until this time. From then on, it's God's responsibility. And in fact, the people of Israel make this consent three times. First of all, here in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 8, And all the people answered together and said, All that Jehovah has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to Jehovah. That is the offer of the broad brush covenant, with no specific detail at this point. But then it comes a second time when they say the same thing. This is Exodus 24, verse 3. And Moses came, coming back down the mountain from one of his trips up, Moses came and told the people all the words of Jehovah and all the ordinances. Now, the words are the ten words. That's the Decalogue, what we usually call the Ten Commandments. The judgments are things that um, come through in the next chapters 20 through to chapter 24. These are expanded details of the covenant. It's ten words and it's ten judgments. And they say, Moses came and told the people all the words of Jehovah and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which Jehovah has spoken, we will do. And then a third time. In Exodus 24 and verse 7. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that Jehovah has spoken we will do and be obedient. You notice that reference to the book of the covenant? This is because Moses was required to make a written copy in his handwriting of the things that God had said. And these two copies, one in God's handwriting, written with the finger of God, and one in Moses' handwriting, were put together, one inside the Ark of the Covenant, and one at its uh, in front of it. This is the formal reading of the written law. These people have now chosen on three separate occasions here to make this choice. We will. We will. We will. And on the fourth time, it's linked to a book. It has become, excuse this little title, it has become a Bible-based covenant. It has become a covenant that is contained in words. Yes, done through power of God, but the book of the covenant. And if we combine what it says here, a little bit later on in this chapter, with what it says in the book of Hebrews, we discover that following this formal reading of the law, Moses then sprinkled the blood on an altar, on the book of the covenant, and on the people. These people had become God's people, sealed with blood to be his, and bound to a written code that God had entrusted to them. Three times they said, I will, I will, I will, to the will of God. Three times Jesus said, 
I will, I will, I will, to the will of God. He was on his way to initiate a new covenant. I'll read it, Matthew 26, verses 39 to 44. Jesus went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. So he left them and went again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. They said at the Sinai Covenant, I will, I will, I will. He is Jesus. The cross is within reach now. And he makes his declaration. I will, I will, I will. There is a, a tradition that John Wesley instituted for the people called Methodists, as he liked to call them. And not just Methodists, but the people called Methodists. And every year at the beginning of the year, they would have um, an annual covenant renewal service. And I've done our own version of this on a couple of occasions. And at the culmination of a period of uh, self-examination, reflection, prayer, putting things right that need to be put right, getting sins confessed that needed to be confessed, clearing the decks, they then repeated the words of this together, which modern Methodists do. I don't think they have quite the same period of self-examination and reflection that Wesley had in mind, but uh, they certainly do still use this, or some form of this. And in our own New Covenant renewal services that we've done a couple of times, we had this as well. Just, just listen to the state of heart of these people as they come year after year. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee. All laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee. Or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Are you ready for that, brothers and sisters? It's time for us to go our separate ways. God willing, we look forward to seeing you at another episode of Broken Bread. Same time, same place. Next week. And in the meantime, do consider that prayer. And if you can find the original, there are versions of it. If you go to Bible Base, Friends of Bible Base, you'll actually see that I put up a, um, a copy of it. It's in Old English with all the S's looking like F. So it's not easy to read. But if you read, you'll get a real sense of what that period of self-examination, reflection, prayer really was for the early Methodists. And see if you're ready to come to this place where you can say, I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. 
And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Thou art mine, and I am Thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. It surely will be. It surely will be. God bless you.